Welcome to the Science of Game of Thrones. I'm Jenna Bush from Legion of Leia Vital Thrills in Sci-Fi. I have contributed chapters to Game of Thrones Psychology um, and a bunch of other books in the series. All but one. That one. That one right there. Um, and I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves. We'll start with you. I am Dr. Travis Langley, professor of psychology at Superheroologist on Twitter, best known as the author of the book Batman and Psychology, A Dark and Stormy Night, the best book on Batman ever written by me. <laughs> uh, the editor and lead writer, head nerd of the herd on a series of collections with mostly other psychologists, but we also have some, some knowledgeable experts on nerdy things joining us. Um, Looking at the psychology of popular culture, Star Wars psychology, Dark Side of the Mind, The Walking Dead psychology, Sack of the Living Dead, and Game of Thrones psychology, The Mind is Dark and Full of Terrors. <laughs> and I'm not naming them all because they need their friends. Where's John would really keep us the whole time? Travis, are you also a Mountain Dew sponsored event? Is that I what's try. I, sooner or later, I will get an offer. <laughs> So I'm Tamara Robertson. Um, you guys may know me from such discovery and science shows as Mythbusters and Psyjinx. Um, I'm also a chemical and biomolecular engineer, and I travel the nation doing superhero science, so hoping to lend some of those skills here today. I'm at tlinr85 on all social media platforms. Uh, I'm, I'm Alan. I was very briefly a Mythbuster, and also <laughs> I have a YouTube channel. It's called Sufficiently Advanced, and I'm also the director of Hex Lab Makerspace in Van a fight choreographer and uh, fight former, so I will be talking about weapons. I'm the founder and creator of Combat up in LA. I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I'm a, a, the author of the Joe Ledger series, the Rotten Ruin series, and a bunch of other books. I write uh, comics for Marvel, IDW, and Dark Horse, and one of my, my comics is going to be a, a Netflix series starring Amy Summerholder this fall called V Wars. Um, and uh, I've also been one of the talking heads on History Channel shows like uh, uh, zombies are living history and true monsters and, and so on. Mm. Okay, so let's. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. And so far, he's the only best selling author on the New York Times best selling author on the table. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump off with a question about Joffrey. Um, from, yeah. <laughs> um, he's blind. He's dead. <laughs> yes, yes, he is. He's also evil. Um, so he was, and there were going to be spoilers, just I feel like I should say that. Um, he was poisoned, and that poison does appear to be sort of similar to some real ones. So who wants to talk about poisoning Joffrey? <laughs> oh, I want to talk about poisoning Joffrey. Uh, I wasn't planning to go first, but okay. Um, it's, there, there are all kinds of ways of poisoning Joffrey. Now, how, how many of you have seen Game of Thrones? How many of you saw Joffrey? Yes. 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 And if you don't know what happened, why are you here? Too late for those spoilers. <laughs> uh, there, there are a number of, it's like he died, he dies very fairly quickly. Not just boom, but he dies fairly quickly. And it's like he's, he's got reaction in the face and the neck, uh, trouble breathing, and he's clearly suffering for that brief moment because the eventual person who we find out did it didn't even want him to go easily. And I was I even looking at I was checking with chemists, and I know it's like, what could do this? It's like there are a number of different plants. In in the books they refer to this plant called the strangler. How have you read the books? Yeah. Alright, look at the strangler, it's in there. And, and it's okay, and so this seems to be what's used for that particular poison. And there are there are a number of different plants that could, could do that kind of thing, but what could cause that particular sort of death? And looking overall, if you narrow it down, it's like you can mix up different poisons with belladonna and several others. And but it looks like it has to be strychnine. Looks like, it's like, and yeah, the stuff that's in some rat poisons. <laughs> and so he got it's essentially Jeffrey got a whole lot of rat poison real fast. I'm also wondering if that was meant to be a little symbolic by the person who chose to kill him that way. That seems appropriate. Okay, so then let's jump on to something completely different. Wildfire. Ooh. Very, very cool, really awesome scenes. Napalm. Could you do it? How similar is it to something like Greek no. fire? Anybody who wants it. to answer can take this. 
So it's definitely very similar to, to Greek fire, but um, even more like relevant today, I would say it's very similar to like napalm, <laughs> yes. um, the way that it oh. sticks and it adheres to the victims, and it's able to be shot at long distances, and instead of being a billowing, it's definitely like a straight target. Um, but with Greek fire, which was really interesting, it was actually called sea fire by the Greeks because it was able to float across water and take on the ships, and then on top of it, it was able to like actually explode when it would have impact. Um, and as a, as a chemical engineer, actually, one of the first demos I ever got to see in an internship was um, alkylated, uh, brominated alkyls, which are what flame retardants are made out of. And what's really cool is they burn in air and explode in water. So all of your mattresses are actually containing this ingredient, but the only way to get it to stop is that it self heals. So it's kind of, it's just going to burn until it <laughs> stops. So there's a lot of different chemicals that exist that. Maybe it's still still around a lot earlier than a lot of people realize. Yeah. They'll talk about it with Vietnam, but they discussed whether or not to use it in World War II. Mm -hmm. yeah. And George, uh, George uh, uh, Martin actually got the idea for Greek Fire. One of the things that inspired him was uh, in Platoon, the use of Napalm in Platoon, the movie. Um, it inspired because he thought it was one of the most horrific things he'd seen. And he wanted to build something that had that kind of terror and that kind of you know, fast onset. So. It actually, napalm was actually one of the things that inspired George to create wildfire. Are, are we allowed to talk about any, is this thing, can I talk in this thing? No, not at all. <laughs> are, we, are we allowed to talk about like a DIY version at all? Sure. Is that, is that potentially <laughs> dangerous? How Children, do not tell? listen to this man. Yeah. How, how, how are you going to tell them about how to make Well, so, okay, if we're talking about sort of like the Greek fire properties of like, you know, sticking sticking to people and also like, you know, potentially exploding or whatever, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about those. I think one thing that we should probably address about wildfire is that it very clearly burns like a vibrant green. Like that green color is something that is very specific and unique to wildfire. Um, so if you just need to make a green flame, uh, not that I'm endorsing this, I'm not telling anyone to do this, but um, one way to do that is certain, certain elements do actually uh, give off certain colors of light when they burn. And you can actually determine what chemicals are in certain things by doing what's called a flame test. So uh, one of the uh, most common ones is boron, which is present in borax or boric acid, used to like kill ants or whatever. So if you mix that with a little bit of rubbing alcohol, like your typical isopropyl or whatever, um, that will actually burn with a green flame. And it's a very nice looking green flame. You writing this down? There you go. <laughs> yeah. So we got so you got you got borax and isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol or boric acid, um, and that actually you know you don't want to cook anything in that flame. It's not it's not going to give off anything good for you, but it is like a very nice kind of like almost emeraldy kind of color. So based off of that, at the very least, we know that there are a certain number of elements that have to be present in wildfire. It could be something like copper, which does burn green, or something like boron, which also burns green. And those are sort of the most common ones. There's more exotic elements like barium, which will also present green in a flame test. But um, given, given sort of like the level of technology of Game of Thrones, what the Meisters would reasonably have access to, it's probably there's some kind of copper or boron in wildfire, along with, you know, whatever petroleum products it has to make it like green fire. So don't, don't do that, but that's how you would do that. <laughs> that's a little late to give that warning. <laughs> Mixing it together and burning it. No, there's no green flames. We're good. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be checking the papers the next couple of days. <laughs> okay, so just so you know, we will be taking audience questions at the end. So if you've got anything, just there's a mic right there. Um, so let's talk about the ice wall. Could you build one? And no. if you did, <laughs> how would it work? And can a dragon take it down? Uh, no, you couldn't build one. Uh, it, it, would, it would be an engineering feat beyond any possible, uh, I, I, you couldn't just couldn't do it, it's too big, it's, uh, the, the temperature isn't cold enough for it, you'd have to actually sculpt a glacier to do it. And I, I kind of don't see them being able to do that 8,000 years before the technology level we see in Game of Thrones. Yeah, so just a quick reminder <clears throat> for everyone here who doesn't keep like a, a handbook with them for how big the ice wall is. <laughs> we are talking about something here that is over 700 feet tall, 300 feet wide, and 300 miles long. 
Uh, to put that in perspective, if you want to make that out of ice, you'd need six trillion gallons of water, which, put another way, the entire flow of the Mississippi River, if you had like a giant bucket of water to sort of fill up to make this ice wall, the Mississippi River would have to fill that bucket for 15 days straight before you had enough water to make into an ice wall that size. So it's a, it's a lot of water. I don't know where they're getting it. I mean, <laughs> magic. Right? When in doubt, that's the issue. It's magic. <laughs> I mean, they could have excavated a trench more easily than they could have built the wall. <laughs> the University of uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, actually looked at this and said, um, and obviously they know a little bit about glaciers up there, they said that in order for it to even be the 300 feet thick at the base, it would have to be 28,000 feet wide, just because glaciers actually, they're moving and flowing at all times. So in order to stay frozen like that, it would need to be a deep freeze on top of being that wide just to stay standing but as we've noticed there's actually plants and animals on the other side of the base so it can't actually be that deep of a freeze to yes. stay frozen what was that? glacial creep which yes. is uh, the worst superhero name ever <laughs> <laughs> as, as why the wall doesn't work what if, what if it's not really all ice what if they were like building their super great wall of china and it froze over a lot so you're talking like an ice facade over a more reasonable, like, even then, I mean, to, I mean, we're talking about something that's literally 10 times, over 20 times taller than the Great Wall of China. I think the Great Wall of China clocks in about 30 feet tall. Um, like, we're talking order of magnitude, even if it wasn't made out of ice with glacial creep. Um, you're still talking about, like, he, that, that even the dirt, you know, has to come from, from somewhere at that point. That's like, it's just a lot of material outside of the fact that ice is a terrible thing to be building skyscrapers out of, basically. <laughs> but, you know, they have the children in the forest, so I to do a lot of water spells on it. That's kind of how it's explained away in the right. storyline itself. Yeah. Also, the, uh, the whole idea of a dragon melting it or breaking it, there's this, I, I just recently rewatched the entire one of the things to do with the flu is rewatch the entire day. <laughs> um, the dragon, I granted the dragon's supposed to be dead at this point, but it exhaled flame for like two minutes. Uh, um, there's, it, they should have at least had it breathe a little bit, you know, take, yeah. take a breath and try again. <laughs> but you couldn't, I mean, cruise missiles couldn't have taken that damn thing down. It's um, like screaming for two minutes straight, isn't it? Like, yeah. That's the sort of equivalent. That's a lot. Like, I always want to try it, but no one wants to hear that. It's also be nowhere near two minutes. Yeah, but, 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 it, but it's undead at that point. It works right, different when you're undead. Scientifically it, speaking, it works yeah. differently. Right. Right. If, if, it is, if we're accepting that this is happening in that world, uh, in any fantasy world, you still have to accept that there are certain laws of physics that apply to that world. Now, for some reason, ice is not applying, uh, not you know dealing with the laws of physics, because it would collapse. But, there would have to be some, I mean, for a dragon to breathe fire, it would have to be, have to have some way to generate the gas to ignite. Like and even, yeah, even if it was somehow dead gas and a dead dragon, I'm not sure how that works. How does it produce enough gas in its body? Because even gas, you know, gas still has particles, it still has some mass to it. Where does all that that structure come from in a in a dragon? I, I'm I'm all over this, but I think Tamara's all right. So are we? So uh, we don't actually have like a zoologist here, uh, but we do have people who just like are really into weird animals. That's me and bugs, particularly bugs. Um, so dragons uh, breathing fire and flying. I'm sure we'll get to the flying, but in particular, I did think of a way for a dragon to maybe be able to breathe fire. Okay. So, uh, the closest, like, actual animal I could find to this sort of idea of, of producing fire from your body, uh, it's called a bombardier beetle. Mm -hmm. And so a bombardier beetle, actually in its, in its abdomen, in its, like, butt area, it has <laughs> two glands, essentially. One of them has uh, hydrogen peroxide, the other one has hydroquinone. And to defend itself, it can actually open up a little biovalve in its body that mixes those two chemicals together, it produces a exothermic reaction, it produces heat. So it actually becomes hot enough to like literally boil, talking 212 Fahrenheit. And that expansion of steam when those two chemicals meet and heat up and boil is enough to actually shoot those chemicals out of its butt at, at like <laughs> boiling temperatures. So when reminding me of my old frat party days. 
I, I was never that cool. So, a bombardier beetle uh, can shoot this stuff out of its butt, and for smaller predators that are trying to eat it, like spiders or whatnot, it can actually be lethal. It's, it's very hot. It's not a fire, but it's very hot. And for uh, larger predators, it, the chemicals themselves can actually just be very irritating for, like, you know, mucol, mucosal glands or eyes or whatever. So, two chemicals that mix together that spontaneously combust are called hypergolic chemicals. There's a whole class of these chemicals for um, rocket propellants. So, the two uh, that I was able to find that seemed the most kind of plausible would be hydrogen peroxide, which the bombardier beetle can't produce inside itself, and kerosene. Under certain conditions, with certain catalysts, when you mix those two liquids together, they do combust spontaneously. So, if we have a dragon, and we are to believe that it can have two glands of these chemicals, like a bombardier beetle, then it could mix and shoot out of its throat, or maybe more likely its butt, and it would actually <laughs> produce open fire spontaneously. That doesn't really cover, like, how it has so much smoke. Yeah, the, the volume, it'd be like a 12-pound like skunk pissing out um, four gallons of, of it's not going to happen. <laughs> if, you, if you actually, if you take it away from the second and you, and you want it to come out the mouth and you want it to be a large volume, you can actually look at cows. So they have um, enzymes in their stomachs, multiple stomachs, that are breaking down and, and creating methane. And a cow itself can produce, I had to turn it to liters to gallons, 66 to 132 gallons a day. So if right before the moment that we have this dragon fall from the sky and die, when he's pierced with a spear, you actually see the sack right underneath the throat explode and rupture. So in theory, if that was where it was keeping all the gas, the bigger problem is how did it suddenly recapture it all when it died yeah. to then be able to shoot it again. But until that moment of piercing, you at least have that gas and that volume and you can propel it fast enough and straight enough with a very fast your idea still, it makes more sense for it to come out the butt, though. That's the thing. Is, if you read Discworld books, okay, there, there's a Discworld book in which that is where it works with their dragons. That's also how they fly. For, for I mean, for, in, terms of, in terms of fictional, like, fluid expulsion, I think for both dragons and Spider-Man, butt stuff just is what makes more sense, unfortunately. Things I have learned on this panel. If you say Dracarys to a beetle, it will fart fire. Okay? That would be such a different series with, with farting <laughs> fire dragons. I, but it I would makes, watch it. It makes it more realistic if it comes out the butt. That's what we see in nature. I would watch it. It comes out the butt. Aren't you all glad you came into this panel for the beetle farts yeah. and dragon gas? Because <laughs> being a panelist is all about sober weight and dignity. That's right. <laughs> Well, I think, well, okay, I think we should move on. Flight, I know you're, you're chomping at the bit to talk about dragons flying, Travis. And then we gotta do the weapons. Uh, that, that's easy. <laughs> but it's, why is that? No buts with the weapons. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like, how do they fly? You look at the aerodynamics, I mean, people studying. It's, but any odds are, absolutely, any good chance Michael Habib here? No, okay. Uh, Michael <laughs> Habib is fascinated with flying reptiles, studying the various pterosaurs. It's like looking at the Tyrannodon, trying to find out how they flew. And it's like, how did they get in the air to begin with? One idea with them was that they would actually more glide, which would be the, you know, the, the leaping or falling off a cliff. But he went through and it's like, it looks like the dynamics of it. It's like, they would break their hips each time they flew. So that's not exactly practical. Um, the, the greater guess is it's more of a hop like with bats. And uh, the folks doing the effects on um, Game of Thrones, they study all kinds of animals. You see the way the dragons move along with their wings. Uh, you know, it's very bat-like in that regard. And, uh, it's, yeah, and those wings, how many legs does a dragon have? Two. Four. Four. Do we count? Two. 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 They have two plus the wings. And uh, ha, uh, how many of you know who Neil deGrasse Tyson is? Yeah. All right. Any of you seen his TV show Star Talk? Yeah. Okay. A couple of you saw me. Uh, he has this, this TV. So that time when Neil deGrasse Tyson interviewed me, um, Tyson. Nice name drop. <laughs> Uh, Ty, was like, they know who, our students don't know who he is, so they didn't care. <laughs> they don't know who he is? Oh, okay. Uh, but, right. uh, he was doing an episode on the science of Game of Thrones. 
And I, I, I Skyped in for one segment just talking about the psychology, but I'm listening to him speculating on these dragons. It's driving him crazy all the artwork we can see with four-legged dragons and wings. He's just like, this is not how animals work. You know, outside certain bugs, it's like you're not going to have these six-limbed uh, creatures. Uh, and when they went to me, as I lifted up this uh, Funko Pop dragon from Game of Thrones, I said, look, two legs, two wings, uh, there you go. So that's when I schooled Neil deGrasse Tyson on uh, dragon wings. <laughs> okay, devil's advocate here. Yes. I think maybe we just have a class of like fictional animal that did have some kind of like six-limbed ancestor because Pegasuses also would have to have six <laughs> limbs. Dragons and Pegasi may be a common ancestor in the Fantastic Beast world. Yeah. This is my favorite panel ever. Yeah. <laughs> now, She's I'm, done hundreds. In other panels now, I'm gonna talk about the time that I schooled Travis Langley in a panel. <laughs> And one of the challenges, though, with, with dragons flying, and even if you consider that they, they would have hollow bones, they're too muscular, uh, there's too much weight, uh, the, 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 the mass to, to lift ratios are, are, are wrong. They, it would have made more sense to have a slimmer dragon, but it, its ferocity being in what it can do with the firearm. But they made it a, a, a gigantic, heavy monster, it had to be tons. Now, I, know, I noticed that when they did close-ups of uh, Drogon and the others, the spikes and so on are very flexible. So it does give the impression that they aren't necessarily uh, horn-like matter, but you know, perhaps hollow, um, more like, like bird feathers. So it, it would reduce overall mass. But you still have the, 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 the body weight that it would have to lift. And when you see, you know, they, they did in fact study the, uh, the way in which birds and bats fly. And they do some really nice stuff when it comes and jumps up, but it gets up airborne way too fast for the amount of drag it has. Um, it's, it's not something that they want us to look at too closely, but it's <laughs> fun to look at it too closely because we're on a panel looking at things closely. What about the gas? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> going, going, going back some years ago, Anne McCaffrey did a panel about the you know, Dragon Riders of Pern, and she talked about how there would be gas bladders inside that, that would have a helium type effect or a, a, a heated gas effect when, when you know, because of its internal combustion that might give it some lift. But again, you would still need less mass to lift because that, that would have to be a, I mean, you see how, what the, the blips are like. There's a lot of gas required to lift even that little gondola. So, yep. there, there are animals that zoologists and other studies trying to figure out how can this creature fly? It's like this, this bee, this hummingbird, they should not be able to fly. And they found to figure out with, with, with the, some species, uh, the way they're moving, the wings would generate a vortex that would give this additional lift. But right. those dragons are not moving the wings. <laughs> there said it could be thermal yeah. corns as well. Like I wondered about that. Yeah. I, I was like, I, it seems like it would have to, like, what if their body's really hot and causing lift there? I mean, it is really if, cold. If it's the longest <laughs> winter has come. Winter's here, right? <laughs> <laughs> when, the, the point about the lift. <laughs> too hard to ask questions. Um, okay, so let's talk about Valerian steel and dragonglass steel, and a little bit about the Woo! Yeah! Yes. All right, so. <laughs> no gas. Okay. Um, well, one of the things that I was doing when we were talking about this panel was looking at the Valerian steel and the dragonglass, and what are they in that world, and then what would they be similar to in our world? Um, and the idea behind the Valerian steel is that the way the steel is made, the way it's forged, and the way the weapons are made um, after you know, the destruction of, of the Valerians, uh, that is sort of lost. And you kind of have the same thing in our world with Damascus steel. And for a while, how Damascus steel was made, people weren't really sure. And it's been fairly recently that people have kind of rediscovered how to really forge Damascus steel. Um, but basically, you're talking about the difference between forging a blade out and uh, from just, you know, like smelting the, the steel together and then taking it into where it's a folded type of pattern. Um, like with Damascus and both folded steels, you're looking at layers. And what this does, it makes the steel much, much stronger. Um, now, like with Damascus steel, it's a little bit differently, uh, different than the way like Japanese swords are, are, are made. And the Japanese swords tend to be a little harder. Uh, a lot of times they have a softer, more flexible core wrapped in a harder skin. This gives them extreme sharpness, um, but the edges are actually brittle. That's why in Japanese swordsmanship, 
despite what you see in the movies, you don't actually go edge to edge. Um, now, Damascus steel will also have a sharp edge, but it won't be quite as brittle. A lot of Europeans, a lot of European swords, the way they're forged out, um, even if it's not like a, a Damascus pattern, there's still techniques that are used that, like most people that have handled weapons, they've handled like modern replicas, and a lot of those are just heavy, unbalanced. It's like people would think that a long sword, what most people refer to as a broad sword, is like eight to 10 pounds, and that's just not how it was. Um, the way they would be made is they would have a distal taper, meaning that as the sword heads out to the tip of the blade, it actually gets thinner, not just in the overall dimensions of the blade, but the steel itself gets thinner. And then you can also put in things like fullers, not blood grooves. Those grooves in the sword have nothing to do with blood. It's kind of like an eye beam. It lightens the sword without compromising structural integrity. So we do have methods of forging steel that is very similar to the Valerian steel. And then the dragon glass is just basically obsidian, which if anybody's ever flint napped anything and seen an obsidian blade, it can be ridiculously sharp. Um, and it can be surprisingly strong, but you can snap them, so there, there is that danger there. So those were the two closest things in our world, you know, the obsidian blades and then either a Damascus or a folded blade that would be what I would picture as the Valerian steel. How do they hold up under really high heat? Because the Valerian holds up against really high heat. Right, well, and again, that's where you start to get into the fantasy element because once you forge a sword, any time you heat it to a certain point, you destroy the temper. Um, and that becomes highly problematic, obviously, because the sword will become either way too brittle to do anything with, or it just won't hold an edge. Um, you know, like, especially with a lot of modern replica swords, people always talk about, well, is it high carbon, is it stainless, and all of this, and even a high carbon sword is going to break if it's not properly temple, tempered, or it'll bend and it won't bend back. A real sword should actually have a degree of flex. You should be able to bend it out of line and it'll return to true. So when you're dealing with a lot of high heat, that can damage the blade. So the Valerian steel, however they made it, obviously, maybe there's a magical element to it. I've always wondered Magic. something for like fantasy swords in particular is that you almost always get like a scene, especially for like Game of Thrones, where like you know you have like one of the few swordsmiths in the world who can reforge Valyrian steel from existing Valyrian steel, and it's like they they take they take like the big sword, they melt it down, and they pour it out into like two smaller sword molds. Is, it, is that a terrible way of making swords? Is that like actually like something you could do? Like it seems like melting it down and like pouring it is a terrible idea. But yeah, I mean <laughs> there are you do hear about weapons that have been repurposed, but usually if a longer weapon breaks, then what they'll do is what's still intact is they'll just resharpen that and put an edge on that. Um, you know, like especially when you're looking at uh, the Revolutionary War era, you have a lot of swords that were saber length that had been broken down, and then you see them being used as like short, almost machete length weapons. But they're not reforging them, they're just resharpening them and kind of taking what was left. Because if it's just poured into a mold, they're not going to have any folding of, right. of the metal for the steel, which has been pretty important in the history of, of that kind of weapon. Right, and that's the thing is. You also have, are you looking at a masterwork sword, or are you looking at something that was mass-produced? You know, blades that tended to be forged are a lot stronger than anything that's going to be cast. Okay, a little off-topic. So, in Lord of the Rings, with, with Aragorn's sword, was that actually reforgeable, or would they have just, like, sharpened the little bit that was left and turned into, like, a dagger? Well, they probably would have... You know, maybe they used dragon gas to reforge it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they probably would not have been able to actually reforge that sword. I'm so happy I got to ask like a real sword person that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question about the obsidian, though, uh, the dragon glass. Um, that isn't, that's chipped, not forged. Right. Um, so they're bringing in, um, I forget his name off the top of my head, I'm blanking on it, the, uh, uh, the swordsmith. Um, they bring him in to make the dragon glass swords. Shouldn't they get a, you know, a sculptor yes. or someone who knows how to chip and flake rather than um, somebody that's the thing. metal? Yeah, you would need somebody that knows what they're doing with uh, like flint napping and, and a lot of that because it's not a forging process. Right. It's made by chipping away the, the piece until you get the shape that you want. 
I keep doing Gendry. Keep going, Gendry. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, um, he's so Gendry. muscular from all, so many seasons of rowing that he's really good. <laughs> 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 Actually, I have a quick question about swords. Um, Jamie has to learn to use his other hand with the sword. And how? I mean, could did that? Could that have happened that quickly? So. <laughs> Usually, people are you know, either right or left-handed. Um, one thing that I do is, for myself and also for my students, is we train ambidextrous. Right. Um, but for somebody to have spent so many years working with the one hand and then automatically switching over, it might have been a little tricky. However, we're also talking about somebody that was a highly skilled swordsman. Just because we never saw him working with his left hand doesn't mean he didn't do it. Right. Um, there are a lot of fighting systems, sword and dagger, double sword, where you would use both hands. So if he's been training and is as highly skilled as he is, it's not that hard to believe that he'd be able to switch over. Yeah, now, actually, he would need some time to, to hone his skill, but... And I'm actually surprised they didn't go into that, because I, you know, I've, I've been doing Kenjutsu for 52 years, and we train with both hands. We, you know, I'm right down there, but we train with both hands, because it is not irrational to think that you might have your, your sword arm injured in a fight. Right. Um, so you need to be able to do both. Um, losing one hand may may make him a lesser swordsman, but it won't take away his ability to fight effectively with a sword. He should have been able to, to kick some serious ass. I don't know why they went that direction, because I thought it would have been a little more cool if he was almost good enough, you know, uh, almost as good with that sword. But it, it, it took numbers to stop him rather than him just simply being clumsy with his left hand, which I, I just don't buy. He'd, he'd, if nothing else, he'd be a very dexterous uh, knife fighter with his left. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, when you come down to it, somebody that has spent that much time training, you know, if fighting comes down to, to three basic principles, timing, distance, and proportion. The manipulation of those three things is how combat occurs. And if you understand those concepts, you know, it's not the... You know, it's not the hand, it's not the arm, it's understanding how to apply those concepts. And he's not suddenly going to forget how those concepts are applied just because he lost his main hand. It'd be nice if they gave him a clip on, a screw on knife for his left hand. That would be I really would have liked to have seen the pata, which is basically a gauntlet with the long blade. Oh, yeah. um, I think Willow was the only movie I've ever seen where yeah. they've actually used that weapon. But it's basically a sword, almost like a punch dagger. Or, or three. Oh, Full Metal Alchemist. Oh, yes. How many anime fans are in here as well? Um, so I have a psychology question now. Let's talk about Hodor. Oh. Oh. Hodor. Yeah. Hodor. Hodor. Oh, I'm not going to ask the question that way, I promise. Um, so is there um, a sort of a, anything psychological, a brain injury, anything like that, that would cause somebody to just continually repeat one word? Oh, yes. Um, how do you know what it is? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, so yeah, there, there are a number of different things that cause it. It's very specific brain damage, um, probably to Broca's area of the brain. Uh, he's, he has an expressive aphasia. Uh, an aphasia is a condition in which the person has trouble with communication, which they previously did not have, due to brain injury. Uh, receptive aphasia, you have trouble understanding. You still remember that you can say the words, you can express them, something. you fake your way through a lot of conversations. <laughs> You're having trouble understanding a lot of what people are saying. And expressive aphasia, you understand, but the right words aren't coming out of your mouth. Uh, the guy broke up for whom this area of the brain is named, he had a, a patient who used the word tan. He would say tan for everything. He'd respond, he'd move the way he told. Uh, he had some, uh, very often with these people, they have some paralysis on one side of the body. You know, usually the side that would do the writing, so that's also going to impair their ability to communicate in other ways. When I was an undergraduate, at the age of the room, when I was an undergraduate, uh, I worked in a nursing home, and there was this man who suffered a stroke, paralyzed on the right side of the body, and he could only say two words. And they were, pardon me, but they were party and shitting. <laughs> Those were the only two words he would say. Shitting? Yeah. That, party shitting. Party and shitting. 
Maybe. Be, Actually, how old are we going to say this? Um, but so then he'd greet you with these two words. He'd say those two words for everything, which was really interesting when the preacher's wife came. Because um, those were the only two words he would say. It's like tan for broke his patient. That sounds random. But those two words don't sound completely random. But it's like, no matter what he's thinking, that's all that's getting routed out through. Now, in Hodor's case, he had a head injury in younger days. And uh, of course, we know the choice of word where it comes from, but it's, that could produce it where someone is saying only one word for everything. And his name's not really Hodor. It's different in the book than it is in the TV show, but uh, that's not really his name. And, and he, he has a scar on his head, which bugged me for a while because it was on the wrong side of the body. However, there's a percentage of people for whom it's flip-flopped. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you, know, you hear this bit about the right side of the body does these skills and left so forth. It's overgeneralized, but there's some truth in it, but there's a certain, like the majority of left-handed people, it's, it's reversed. Um, and a tiny percentage of right-handed people, it's reversed. So, let's just say, okay, Hodor is one of those that's reversed. It's actually the right spot on the head for an injury that could cause that uh, damage to Broca's area. Hodor. Oh. Um, so let's talk about White Walkers since I've been staring at that mask for the entire panel. Um, so, so many questions about them. Could they exist? How does the body rot and, can, and it still stays up? Oh, that's so cute. Um, and wouldn't the, any liquid left in the body freeze because it's cold? Tell me all about White Walkers. All right, so we're going to get into weird animals again. <laughs> My background is electrical engineering, but I love me some weird animals. Uh, so, White Walkers, uh, one, of the, one of the things that was brought up on Twitter when, when we were discussing like, you know, possible areas of discussion here is how are, how are the Whites and the White Walkers actually moving around when they sort of seem to be these like uh, preternaturally frozen beings, like they're existing sort of in these frigid temperatures, they have sort of these, these ice weapons, and it seems like they themselves probably are some kind of frozen, or at least not body temperature. Um, so, in North America, there is an animal called a wood frog, and it's prevalent in Alaska and Canada, and a wood frog, as part of its hibernation process, can actually be frozen solid for up to seven months at a time, and when spring comes around, it thaws out and it hops around perfectly okay. Um, so, the way that it does this is it can actually accumulate two chemicals called urea and glucose in its tissues. And of course, glucose um, is just sugar. I'm sure that uh, uh, you've heard that before. And those two chemicals act as what are called cryoprotective. Cryoprotectants. Mm. Um, so cryoprotectant basically just lowers the glass transition temperature of tissue. And that's kind of exactly what it sounds like. The glass transition temperature, if you're thinking like um, the Terminator shattering into a billion little pieces when it's been frozen, it's the temperature after which flesh, instead of acting as like a bouncy, pliable, soft thing, acts like a brittle, uh, glassy, hard thing. So uh, the main issue with like a white walker walking around is that uh, at freezing temperature, you wouldn't expect it to be made of meat and be able to actually like move. So I propose that whites and white walkers, as part of their uh, mutation process and becoming a white walker or a white, actually develop these cryoprotectants in their tissue so that they are actually still kind of flexible even at freezing or near freezing temperatures. That concludes, my, that concludes my presentation on what There's also, a, there's also a ground squirrel that uh, freezes as well. Uh, does a very similar thing. Uh, the, fro the, the, the frog, the ground squirrel, there's a couple of other uh, creatures that, that do freeze like that, but they don't move while they're frozen, and that's, that's one of the problems. I've written a whole, uh, probably about a fifth of the novels I've, I've published have been zombie novels, and uh, one of the challenges there is to try to make zombies make sense. Um, and each book, I, each, each time I do a new zombie novel, I, I have to uh, basically uh, mug a bunch of scientists to get them to come up with plausible theories. Uh, the closest I got to, I used prions in one case and, and uh, so on, the closest I got to was actually parasites that, that inhabit the body and uh, you know, hardwire or, or, or rewire the, uh, um, uh, the cranial nerves, rewire uh, a, lot of, a lot of the uh, nervous system. Uh, it's actually hijacked, so they, they can operate the function even with, with the loss of, of intelligence, which gives you the, the White Walker's ability to, to um, at least move around, because the parasitic 
force of driving it. But the cold fact that you can't get around, there's, 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 no, there's nothing in science that will allow frozen tissue to be flexible enough to walk. Um, and also you have, you have creatures, like watching the fight scenes, they don't act according to any laws of physics in those fight scenes. Because if, even if you go with the fact that, okay, you gotta behead them or, or burn them to kill them, you see them in the fight scenes, they're stabbing them and, and, and hitting them with, with blades across the chest and the White Walker's falling down. Most of those cuts aren't big enough to actually destroy the spine or enough of the, the scaffolding of the skeleton to knock it down. So, unfortunately, the, the White Walker thing, is, it's, it's gone past science into just pure magic. I would like to counter All right. <laughs> with the idea that, that uh, we know that the temperatures, at least around the wall, cannot be that cold because there's a forest there. There does, there, it, it exists, there's a forest, and it's for at least several miles. So we know that there is a lower limit to the temperatures, at least around. So, so as winter continues to take hold and it snows everywhere, technically the, 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 the Night King's army should then freeze. Well, not if they head to Westeros. Yeah. Oh! They gotta, they gotta go through, they gotta go through the north first. and get real damn cold up there. So, I, I submit to you that a crowd protected lowers the glass transition temperature, and it also actually lowers the freezing temperature itself. I'm sure that you've, you've uh, Tasted the difference between biting into an ice cube and biting into a popsicle, which does have a lot of sugar in it. It does actually freeze differently, and it freezes at freezes at a different temperature. I think that <laughs> if you took a dead body and you reanimated it and you injected it with a ton of glucose and urea and you put it out in a frigid environment, not like 40 below zero frigid, which is actually both true for Celsius and Fahrenheit, so I don't have to say a unit. But for negative 40, I say I say in a in a tundra environment where there are still like you know dire wolves and, and trees that are still alive. I say that body is still mobile. Okay, so, so basically the, the, the Night King is an organic chemist and mad scientist. Oh, no, 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 the children of the forest are. Not oh, him. Yeah, All right, fair enough. <laughs> oh, also magic, yes, yeah, also, magic. Magic. also magic. Well, also magic. That's, that's one of the things in, in when we write science fiction, I mean, uh, when, I, when I build my, like, a zombie story or a werewolf or vampire story, I try to build on as much scientific plausibility as possible so that it's harder to tell where science leaves off and fiction begins. Um, but there is always a point in our novels where we have to just not answer the question. Um, like, George is not going to answer any of these questions that we're discussing in his book, because that's the point at which he goes, well, fuck it. Uh, <laughs> we were PG-13 until that one. I think yeah. we had just enough of the S-words to be PG-13. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm potty mouth. I'm a novelist. Of course, I'm, I'm professionally potty mouth. We're just default to say it's PG-13. You get to go stronger one or two times. All right, there we go. So before we ask the next, hi, I, I do. Um, before I do, though, if anyone has questions, the mic's right there. You can go line up. Um, I do want to ask about the psychology of evil because we have it's bad. Cer it's bad. Bad, very bad. Evil's bad. Well, we have like Cersei and Jamie who uh, incesty and all, and that's that's its own thing. Um, but you can kind of incest. Incest is a great word. Um, but I, I mean, I feel. I feel like you might understand where they come from, but Joffrey, mm, no. So, so tell us about evil. Of course, in my, in my field of psychology, we tend to avoid that word. And it's, I mean, I write about it in every single one of my books. But uh, we tend to, we, we'll look at things, and what do people call evil? For, the, for a large extent, we've got, it's a philosophical question, it's a theological question. So one of the things we look at is the worst qualities of human beings. Uh, there's what's called the dark triad, not to be confused with the McDonald triad. Um, that's uh, the, the dark triad. It's that in combination, uh, if somebody is narcissistic by itself, that doesn't make them evil, it just makes them really self-absorbed. Um, if, if they are also Machiavellian, very manipulative. It still, in and of themselves, that just might mean it's like they're really good at running the business. Um, there's, there's a, those two, together with psychopathy, uh, the, the psychopath is missing the emotional aspects of a conscience. And it's like, that's a bad combination. Although you could have somebody who's high functioning and still they qualify a lot on all three of those. And so the start triad, the people who originally researched it realized, oh, we need to add one more thing, sadism. The person who has that stuff and is sadistic actually takes delight in the suffering of others. That we're going to call evil. Uh, but for the, the psychopath itself, a lot of research mainly on that one. That's one of the ones they can be the most objective about, even though there's 
People misuse the word. It used to be, if you heard the word psychopathic in a movie, they actually meant psychotic or vice versa. Uh, and now, as I always have people ask me about sociopath, there's no standard definition. Um, and the psychopath is defined based on the visible symptoms, not the origin, but those who study it that way for that word over sociopath tend to view it as there is a biological component. There is something genetic, hereditary, that they've seen in the life history of these individuals. And the psychopathic, there's a measurable difference in brain activity, especially this P3 wave. Uh, you see a difference particularly in the amygdala, the cingulate gyrus, and uh, a certain area of the temporal lobe of the brain, having to do with uh, emotional associations, self-control, those sorts of things. The original study on it was like 100% of the psychopaths in the study all showed this difference in the P3 wave, and 90% of the non-psychopaths did not. And, it, it was, and they, they keep studying this and say, where does this come from? And they don't completely know. One thing they have though is like the, the psychopaths have a higher frequency of having some kind of early brain injury. Not most of them, but they do have a higher frequency of having that in their lives. I'll say, the, None of the people say, say, okay, we had somebody who was perfectly normal, one day they had a brain injury, and then they're bad. We're talking about something early in development, before personality's forming. And the novels refer to Joffrey having had a severe head injury early in life. So, in terms of being able to pull anything other than his upbringing, <laughs> uh, that, there is that one thing we can pull from. There's also his parents are twins. Yeah, there's also the, gen yeah. also the genetic anomaly. <laughs> which, which, which narrows the genetic options. Yeah, it, I mean, when, you talk, when you start looking at the genetics of, of incest patients, a lot of the recessive genes suddenly become prevalent, and it has been a study that they've actually seen increased um, numbers of schizophrenia, for instance, in incest patients. So when we also look at the Targaryens that are known for being incestual, they had the Mad King, so it could stand to reason that Joffrey kind of got a triple whammy with that upbringing. And, and what, genetic, if what genetic influence seems to be going on with psychopathy? I mean, they haven't identified specific genes for the most part, but what, what you smack look in the heredity, it looks recessive. And there, in which case, something such as the incestuous relationship, it's not just them, it's uh, you know, the, 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 the other side, you know, the girl with the dragons, our family too. Um, and of course, they got, they got more of the psychosis going on over among them. But you would have a higher frequency of these things in which it takes the recessive gene because you've narrowed the available genes when you get the same one for both parents on a number of your chromosomes. Especially with twins. Yeah, yeah. It's a little creepy. Oh, it's so gross. All right, we're going to open it up to you guys. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. I have a throwback question. Season one. Um, Daenerys climbs into a pyre and she's okay. Well, I put that on the list earlier. Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> okay, so we were talking about wildfire earlier and different things that burn differently uh, and different colors, but I'm wondering is there something, and I know she's, you know, magic. Um, but is there a substance that we know about that could have that kind of a sustained burn and have that visible orange flame for an extended amount of time? Do we have any pyroprotectant chemicals that you know about? Okay, are, are we talking about like da Daenerys herself not burning, or are we talking about the, the, the pyre itself burning? I was thinking the pyre burning because I was thinking Daenerys and kind of writing off his magic. Ah, uh, okay. But you okay. can, I don't know, if you have an answer for that one, that'd be great. Dragon oh, gas. Can, I'm sure we can, <laughs> I'm sure we can come up with something on the spot here. Uh, I, I think, um, I don't know, in terms of, in terms of, like, what's on the pyre, yeah, it's probably, given their level of technology, some kind of, like, uh, tar or other, like, um, e easily accessible petroleum products. Um, you know, it's, it's probably something that, um, you know, burns with an orange kind of a dirty flame because when you have an orange flame, like if you think about your like a typical match or whatever, that that orange color is coming from uh, the actual carbon that is coming off of the thing that's burning. So it's usually a sign of like uh, something dirtier, kind of like burning in wood or burning uh, a fuel, especially under like normal atmospheric conditions. So for example, um, if you, you know, have, have like a regular butane lighter, um, there's a lot of orange in that flame, turn the lighter on, versus like a butane torch, like one of those uh, windproof butane torches, the flame becomes blue, just because you're, you're burning more of it uh, more efficiently by having more air run through it. So that's where the orange color is coming from. It's probably some kind of hydrocarbonous something 
Um, granted, like, you know, depending on the size of the pyre, you know, it, it's questionable if, if it's going to be burning all night long or whatever. There's probably a ton of wood on there, too, just, you know, from, from there. Um, as far as Daenerys goes, that one's tricky because it's not, it's not just that she, like, doesn't, like, combust. She is, like, just heat proof because we do see in the first season like various examples of her like you know being in the bath that's way too hot yeah. and they're like oh that's scolding she's like oh that's fine so it's like it's it's <laughs> it's like some combination of like you know whatever her skin and her hair in the tv show oh, in the TV yeah show. yeah in the, in the tv show at least whatever her skin and her hair are made of not only is it something that doesn't burn but it like openly combusts in the flame. It's also something that is actually like heat proof. Like it doesn't actually enable her to feel pain. Um, yeah, and, and clearly lung tissue and, and so on are, are equally invulnerable because she has to be breathing while she's in there. So, right. I, 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 I can't think of any animals off the top of my head. I can think of like pine cones, right? Pine <laughs> cones which are designed to like not only survive a forest fire, but actually to open up and actually disperse their seeds in the presence of fire. Um, but they so, probably get crispy. So one of those mad Targaryen so one of those mad Targaryen ancestors was a dendrophile. <laughs> Some people really love trees. Uh, Thank you. I didn't know what that was. Dendrophile. Okay. So you uh, you had a follow up question? No, that was a Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, this one's for Steve. Okay, you're given the choice of either Longclaw, Oathkeeper, or Neil to fight with. Which do you choose and why? Dragon Gas. <laughs> so brittle! Dragon Gas. It's so Dragon Gas. Dragon Gas. He just loves that answer today. Um, I have a scientific question. What might account for the erratic seasons that are continuously happening again and again throughout Westeros? So actually it kind of links to the weaponry too because you have the obsidian and the dragon glass. Um, but a volcanic eruption could actually account for this because when the ash and the chemicals go into the atmosphere, it can actually cloud it to cause the temperatures to drop. So like a historical reference to this would be like the Krakatoa eruption in Indonesia in 1883. That spread actually circled the globe, um, affecting temperatures all the way to Europe. So because we know that the whole Valerian civilization ended because of volcanic eruptions, it stands to reason that that cloud would still be in the atmosphere at this point, affecting the long winters, and also would account for why they suddenly have all of this um, dragon glass. And Martin also has this idea in his head about that planet taking a different path around its sun relative to ours. Wait, is that canonical? He's talking about it. Oh, oh, oh I don't know whether it's mentioned in the book, but he's talking about it. I like the volcano explanation better. <laughs> it seems a little cleaner than like, oh, the planet Westeros sun has a weird orbit. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, so does that mean then that um, prior to the eruption on Valyria, were the seasons normal? I don't because I, I was under the impression yeah, that it was always arrived. Yeah, and they, I don't think they've, they've covered it, and since they're doing a couple of prequel shows, I'll be curious to see if they tackle it. I'll have to email George, George and ask him that. Because <laughs> <laughs> he may not have thought of it yet. He's like, oh, I should put that shit in. <laughs> <laughs> they have a history of periodic eruptions. It's like the, the very long-term version of Volcano Old Faithful. Yeah. Yeah, and they can't predict how long the win when the winter's going to come back. So, so some of that may just have to do with they, their recorded history doesn't go far enough back for them to have the information available to make the prediction. The right. maesters are very good at their jobs. They record everything. <laughs> they, they've got you know, 5,000 years of recorded history. They still might not have quite enough. Thank you for the question. <laughs> oh. um, this question is for Travis. Um, I think it's safe to say that a lot of people in Westeros have... Um, traumas or severe mental <laughs> issues. Um, my question is, what in your opinion is the most dangerous person in Westeros? Ooh. In terms of psychosis or um, in just in terms like, say for example, who would be more dangerous, Cersei or Arya, in, in terms of their mental. Who gets more people killed? Cersei. Cersei, through sheer power that they think she managed to orchestrate. I mean, there's, you know, one little thing going on at this, uh, you know, a 
the welfare explosion uh, that, that she's behind. Is, in terms of just in, is, is, who's more dangerous? It's like, it depends on the skill. It's like, uh, who's better with the weapon? Are we talking long bow, short bow? Or are we talking, it's like, which is better, a gun or a knife? It depends on how close you're standing. <laughs> Far apart, gun! You're up close by the time they have that gun drawn. So it's like, in terms of just sheer basic dangerousness, okay, who's gonna stab, who's gonna be able to stab more people quickly? Are you a skill? Yes. Who has a conscience? Arya. Arya more so though. We do see it's like where, where she's in danger of that being kind of shut off, that part of her being shut off. And she has to reconnect and reawaken it. And you see that with some, some people who've gone through horrible situations in the world. It, it doesn't mean they're turned into psychopaths, but they look like it. it. It's because that part of them is kind of shut off. Uh, like, like part of them is sleepwalking through existence. Uh, and, and you hope it can be reawakened. A lot of evidence is those who've made it to that point can be reawakened. Arya, in, in terms of like you talk about the trauma, yeah. Arya and her sister Sansa, they're some of my favorite examples of something we call post-traumatic growth. Uh, somebody who's gone through severe trauma and it, it definitely had some symptoms of PTSD, especially re-experiencing the traumatic events more than other people. Uh, that's, that's more common with post-traumatic growth in general. Uh, but, and they may have even had full PTSD, maybe not, but um, they've, they've taken their pain and they've, they've found purpose and helps motivate them and help them to grow. And it's, and I realize this is off topic from your, your question, but I, I love, Ari's my favorite character. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is just more of a vigilante too, because she definitely is totally She's their punisher. Exactly. It's a punisher is kind of a psychopath though. <laughs> This, yeah. but, I mean, but you see it too when she's serving out the poison wine. Like mm -hmm. she says, I'm not, I'm not wasting good wine on a stupid girl. Right. But it's because she's saving the young women because she, in her mind, they weren't at fault. They weren't evil. So like throughout, even though she is doling out a lot of murder and death, she's doing it in her mind to the people that are deserving of it. Right. She's got that, that coldness of the psychopathic personality, but she still has a conscience, even if she's cut off a right. bunch of the emotional aspects. And one, of, one of the things also about Cersei is, I mean, she's killed probably the most people, but because she of her political position, not because of her personal power. I mean, she we've seen her in one-to-one -one confrontation situations where she is not particularly threatening, she's not a fighter. Where Arya um, has, is, has the strategy to do mass murder, which she did in, in uh, to the, the phrase, but also has the individual personal power that she's acquired. I think she's more dangerous in the long run, uh, but less likely to do danger to the innocent. But Ramsey Bolton, incredibly dangerous person. Um, he's he's a bit short on the self control that it takes to maintain some of that success in the long run. Cersei. She has self-control in some areas, but then she also makes some impulsive decisions. It's like, so many things that have happened to Cersei are the consequences of things she said in motion. It's like, hey, let's empower these sparrows. Right, you know? but, but, but fewer, yeah, yeah, but, um, and Arya's making fewer impulsive decisions as she goes along, which is interesting. She's showing real growth and an understanding of who she is. And, and yeah, Ramsey will take delight in anybody's suffering. So she's a bit more, she, she, she's got more refined sadistic concerns. It's like, you really need to have ticked her off, or for her to say, you're going to suffer, you're going to watch your daughter die. Uh, Ramsey's like, no, I was like, he loves anybody's suffering. He is the biggest sadist in the bunch. So now yes. it's 8.30, but since we only have one more question left, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Talk about the poison that uh, was used to kill Cersei's daughter. Cersei's yes. daughter? Oh, the lipstick yes. yeah. poison. Yeah. And, and, and yes. The effects yeah. it had, though. That one is a bit harder to uh, tie to real poisons. Uh, <laughs> it is. It's, I've been looking at this. I, I, I haven't found anybody who's. I mean, I've talked to some chemists on this one, too. It's because it, it's no harm at all to the person who's wearing it. Well, let's wipe it off afterwards. But then she does drink the... the, no, the she, but she also, she does drink this. And so she's got the sand up, she has some kind of chemical to help counteract it. How long has she had it? Is it like, uh, you know, Gus Fring? Very good bad dance? All right, Gus Fring's poison. Um, and, but, and he's there, so that he, he's taken something beforehand, he, he gets treated afterwards, and he vomits it up as soon as he can to get it out of his system. And so she's taking an antidote to whatever the chemical is, but it is very light and not fast enough acting to her, her, so she has time to get it off, and it affects, uh, 
Thank you. Yeah, when it's used on Marcel. Yeah, the, 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 the timing is, is definitely off in the, the right chemical reaction. The timing is off for real poisons. Yeah. And, and the antidote acts like at the speed of a neurotoxin, which you know doesn't really make a lot of sense either. Could it be though? Too, I mean, we see it mostly enacted on um, younger children. You know, it's it's the young that are being affected pretty like rapidly by it. Could that be? Mm. I don't know. I'm just spitballing. <laughs> or you know, Princess Bride. She just. I was just going to say, I don't hate power. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I believe that wraps it up. So um, we're going to go down the line and talk about uh, where we can be found online. I'm Jenna Bush at Jenna Bush Everywhere, USCH, like the beer, not the president. I have super allergies. This is my first, the first of my six panels this weekend. Uh, I'm easy to find online Facebook, Twitter, Amazon. Um, I'm at T Lynn R85, T L Y N N R85 on all social media platforms. Uh, YouTube.com slash sufficiently advanced. I build cool stuff. Also be uh, at Science of Avengers Endgame tomorrow if you're interested in that. Uh, CreativeCombatLA.com and Instagram Creative Combat. And to answer your question, Long Claw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really uh, JonathanMayberry.com. Just spell the last name right. There's no Y in the middle. M A B. Um, and also you know, Instagram, Twitter, you name it, I'm all on there. And thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you.